Good afternoon, everyone. My name is George Onufriu, and today I'm going to be talking to you about artificial intelligence, or more specifically, encrypted deep learning. So, a little bit about me. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Lincoln, uh, more specifically uh, akin to a data scientist, and I'm a very big privacy and Linux enthusiast, as uh, many of you who, who might know me or know, uh, or know all about that last one. Uh, on screen, you can see my GitHub profile uh, and a QR code. So feel free to click on that QR code. It will take you to the repository for this uh, presentation. Drop me an issue, and uh, we, we, can have a, we can have a chat. Now, my work, just a little bit more about me, is deep learning specifically, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence, and probably also the coolest part of it as well. It's the, it's the mind, it's the thinking, it's the reasoning. And along with that, I also work with fully homomorphic encryption, which is a very special form of encryption, which I'll introduce a little bit later. And I use these two things together for agriculture, or more specifically, yield prediction. So that is, in this case, strawberry yields. So predicting how many strawberries we're going to get, how many we can uh, sell, how many will be on the shelves so that you can go buy them. So, you know, this is very much a food on the table kind of thing. And you can see here, actually, uh, the uh, pest problem and, you know, the uh, interesting scenario of pests and, you know, what, what kind of things they're up to eating overripe strawberries, although you might not necessarily see them as overripe and, you know, generally having their lunch on uh, what would otherwise be ours. So without further ado, what is artificial intelligence? You know, is it the T-800 coming for John Connor? You know, is it coming back in time to stop the human revolution? You know, is it, you know, what sort of thing is it? Well, I would I'd probably say it wouldn't. You know, it isn't, this is more cinematography, but it does represent one of our ever going, ever present fears of artificial intelligence and robotics is that, you know, one day they might overthrow us or they might become better than us or, you know, they, they might take up positions or all sorts of things, you know, so some very genuine concerns. Now, what about HAL 9000? Well, I probably also wouldn't say that you know, our current artificial intelligence is a homicidal, spacefaring uh, sentience or, or being. But interestingly enough, HAL is described as being capable of speech, you know, talking to us, processing our language, recognizing who we are and our facial recognition, uh, lip reading, you know, being able to tell what we're saying, the uh, art appreciation, you know, being able to discern you know, uh, art and which is which is better and, you know, how much it appreciates them, which is quite a difficult thing to kind of define in the first instance. And, you know, some other general things like playing chess. Now, I'd probably say that while HAL is described as uh, this kind of general intelligence, it's, a, it's able to do all of these things simultaneously, current artificial intelligence is more narrow. It is you know, it can do one of these things or a few of these things, but very well, but only those things very specifically. So I'll take the, the low hanging fruit, as they say. So the first one that I'll tackle is chess. You know, can current AI play games with us? Can it beat us in games? And the answer to that is yes, we've been able to beat people in chess since 1996. You know, it's, uh, it's quite a a uh, well-traversed field, and more recently in the last few years, we've been able to beat humans in even more complex games like Go and uh, Dota 2 and, uh, you know, all, all sorts of games that you, that you might have experienced. What about speech and natural language processing? Well, I'm sure you can already think of several examples of uh, a form of artificial intelligence that can talk to you or that can respond to you. And, you know, the first one that comes to my mind is, Alexa, you know, I, I won't, won't say that too loudly, you know, but there, there are many forms, you know, by Microsoft, by Google, you know, uh, coming in from all angles. And they, while I wouldn't necessarily say they are perfect, but for mass produced, uh, ever available AI, it's, uh, it's quite a good indicator, you know, it's quite a complex problem to solve. What about art, or art appreciation more specifically? Now, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to say, you know, uh, how much does someone appreciate art? 
you know, I, I think that's more of a consequence of embodiment or being, you know, having a body. You know, you might say this person appreciates art because, you know, they might visit gallery, they might buy art pieces, they might, uh, you know, spend, uh, they might converse to you about art, you know, which is something a lot more difficult to do if you don't have a body, if you are just this artificial intelligence. So that, that might be one that, that is a little bit looser. But for now, I'll skip facial recognition and lip reading just, just for a little bit, and I'll come back to those in a minute. But the image you can see here is a very psychedelic image produced by Deep Dream, uh, which was first proposed by Google. And it's this artificial intelligence that keeps applying what it imagines, you know, what, what it's seeing inside the image. And because, you know, a particular focus is, especially for humans and the data set is on animals, you know, you can kind of see that it's imagining animals, you know, especially with eyes, which also tends to be a focus for humans as well. You know, and it can be very difficult to interpret what the original image is. Now, another uh, example of art is style transfer. So this is a neural network or uh, uh, artificial set of artificial neurons that can take an image, some source image, uh, like the one that you can see at the top left, and then apply some style. So let's say Starry Night. You know, you can take whatever image you have on hand and apply Starry Night to it. You know, and you can do this at home as well. It's not, um, it's not restricted, you know, it's not restricted. So an example is with Deep Dream Generator, which you can go online, take some source photo, have some uh, style that you'd like to superimpose onto it, and the, you'll queue up uh, some neural networks to, to do these, you know, these uh, pieces for you effectively transfer the style from one to the other. You know, and you can see a few examples of it here. I particularly like the Fox one myself. But what's specifically, what is deep learning and what makes it interesting? You know, what's so cool about deep learning? And fundamentally, all deep learning is, is just machines making sense of the world. It's just machines recognizing patterns just like we humans do and we do it with a in a very similar way to how we imagined it worked with us you know with these artificial neurons you know some uh, sensory input that is being output with with some weights you know it's a, it's a very old model of how we imagined uh, our uh, neurons worked but uh, nonetheless it produces uh, great results now for us it's very easy to perceive things, you know, or, or should we say we do it very intuitively. You know, if you've ever seen Jim Carrey before, you can, you know, very easily recognize his face, or if you've ever seen Jack Nicholson before. But if you had to describe specifically what made up Jim Carrey's face, you know, how would you do it? Would it be the distance between the eyebrows? You know, what, what happens if he's making an expression or he's changing his expression or he's talking or, you know, all sorts. It, it's, well, we do it very intuitively. It's, it's a very tricky scenario for machines to, to understand. But fundamentally, it's just a set of cool techniques to take these neurons from one place to another, and you can use them in so many different ways. And one of those ways that you can see on the right is called deepfake, where you take uh, one person's face and you can superimpose someone else's automatically. You know, it can recognize the boundaries of a face, what makes up that face, and it can superimpose, in this instance, Jim Carrey's face in The Shining. So you can watch a good portion of the film with Jim Carrey instead of Jack Nicholson. And you can do very similar things with voice. Uh, so if you uh, go on YouTube and find Control Shift Face, you'll be able to see things like Home Stallone, so instead of home alone, you know, but, um, you know, and that is, that has the voice included. Now, deep learning has become state of the art in almost every field it has become applied to, or every field that has enough data to teach these machines, you know, to, to teach them uh, the representations or how to recognize these patterns. But this leads to our problem. We have a wonderfully whimsical technology. You know, it can do some really great, really interesting, fascinating things, and each one's different. It's incredibly effective at very specific tasks, but it requires a lot of data to learn. So where do we get this data from? 
and what sort of deep learning slash neural networks do we create with it? So, you know, already in San, Fran Fran <coughs> Sorry. San Francisco, for instance, they have banned facial recognition uh, because of fears of, let's say, uh, a social credit system or being misused by, by law, law enforcement, just like it already is in, in certain parts of the world. And, you know, you can see just a, a stock photo of uh, surveillance. Now, the solution to this problem, in my opinion, is that special form of encryption I referred to earlier, which is fully homomorphic encryption, which I just call FHE. Now, what's special about it is it can be added and multiplied to. So currently, you already use encryption for most of your day-to-day -day tasks when it's, let's say, um, doing your banking, uh, web browsing, you know, watching the movies that, that you like. You know, all of this data tends to be encrypted between you and the endpoint. But the difference is the encryption that you use on a day-to-day -day basis is static. You can't do anything with it. it. It has to be verbatim from you to them and from them to you. Whereas fully homomorphic encryption allows you to change it, that allows you to adapt it. So it gives us the ability to apply operations like addition and multiplication, which might sound simple, and they are simple operations, but fundamentally, with just those two operations, you can do the entirety of deep learning. You can now use these state-of-the-art neural networks while they're encrypted and predict something maybe sensitive, like let's say medical diagnosis. So now instead of having uh, issues with uh, privacy um, that are very difficult to overcome, you can instead encrypt the data, send it to someone else while it's encrypted and without any ability to decrypt it, someone else who, let's say, has the hardware or the uh, technological know-how to run these neural networks and then get state-of-the-art results in things like diagnosis or, let's say, prediction where trade secrets are involved. So that can improve things like um, efficiency of food growth, you know, and provide provide more food, make things cheaper, you know, or let's say even with your Amazon Alexas, you know, they can all keep, sorry, <laughs> I should have said that a little bit quieter, but they can all keep <clears throat> their own keys. So your voice, for instance, never leaves the Alexa, only in encrypted form does it ever leave it, and it's not decryptable beyond the Alexa, which originally uh, encrypted that that voice. Now, you can see here just a, a short example of what uh, encrypted deep learning might look like. And it's very, very simple. It, it can just be done with uh, multiplication and addition. Now, I won't go too deep into um, the technical details of fully homomorphic encryption. This is more to be. Uh, an overview to kind of introduce it to you more so than anything else. Now, if you're interested in computer science or deep learning, uh, I got here through the standard. <laughs> I got here through the standard academic route. You know, exploring the different things that interested me. <laughs> yeah. uh, exploring the things that interested me. Uh, getting to know. Uh, people, because you'd be surprised at the doors people can open, especially in such a broad field like computer science. You know, it can take you to a lot of places, but everyone is different, and you might not want to go through the academic route. But thankfully, computer science can be learned quite easily and freely most of the time by anyone with a reasonable computer or uh, a stable internet connection. Now, some good places to start would be Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow, uh, which is a, a little bit more of an in-depth book. But if you're just starting out from, from scratch, I might recommend something like Coursera, the Deep Learning Specialization, and that'll take you through step by step. And if you're more advanced and you want to uh, find out a little bit more or, let's say, make things click, uh, like I did with uh, Backpropagation, uh, I would take a look at Andre Carpathy's YouTube series on deep learning. So to summarize, I introduced myself. 
I introduced the problem of secrets after talking about deep learning. I briefly told you what fully homomorphic encryption is and what we can kind of gain from it, how I got here, and how to find out more if anything interests you. And I've uh, put in uh, one of the strawberries uh, as thank you for your time. Here are some of my references. And again, if you have any questions after the fact, please visit the link and uh, we, we can have a chat. Uh, thank you very much and uh, see you around.